But they also had some other problems. So they turned to the rich and powerful Jewish community, including the first president of the state of Israel, Chaim Wiseman. This guy was key in helping fund and equip the British war effort, World War I. He did something else. Germany had cornered the market on acetone. I don't even know what that is. Sounds nasty. It's a key ingredient for arms production. Britain didn't have any. What are they going to do? Germany has it all. They would have lost the war. But Wiseman invented a formation process that allowed the British to manufacture their own liquid acetone. So the British were like, thank you, thank you, what can we ever do for you? Wiseman was a leading voice for Israel's statehood. On November 2nd, 1917, they took a little piece of paper out of the drawer from the Imperial Hotel, and they wrote on this piece of paper what is known as the Balfour Declaration. It was a, a formal statement uh, by the British government saying that, okay, we're going we're gonna to do a Jewish homeland for you. In the British-occupied region that was, uh, what was it, ancient Palestine? Is that what they were calling it? British-occupied ancient Palestine, okay? It was land that really nobody really wanted. Now, let's bring in Woodrow Wilson again, because he had a pet project of, I'm going to put together a global government. It was called the League of Nations. They ratified that Balfour Declaration in 1922. The declaration and the ratification caused Jews to be optimistic that, oh, I don't know, maybe somebody's going to keep their word and give us a homeland. Jewish immigrants started to uh, flee to the area and start to live there. And the Arabs, who really didn't like the Jews, but then again, at this time period in the world, who did? They became fearful that this would become a national homeland for the Jews, and they don't want all these Jews living there. 1936, still, haven't, haven't done the Balfour Declaration. Hadn't done it. 1936, now there's fighting between the Jews and the Arabs. There's fighting in Russia between the Russians and the Jews. And in Europe, the Jews are being ready to be pushed into ovens. It's bad. An anti-Semitic sentiment was spreading throughout the Middle East and Persia. Persia. I'm going to bring you over to a map here in a second. Hitler decides to get into the mix. Because... The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Jewish people are getting it from all sides. And Hitler decides, you know what? We have so much in common. You hate the Jews? I hate the Jews. Hey, 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 let's have lunch. Hitler's top propagandist, this evil guy, Joseph Goebbels, right there next to Hitler. Evil. Remember, he had Wilson's writings, or the, uh, the people that did all the propaganda here in America, in his library. He epitomized hate. He wrote that the Jews uh, needed to be thrown out. Give them a serious beating, quoting Goebbels. He said, we see Jewry as a direct threat to every nation. Jewry is a contagious infection. And there can be no place or no peace in Europe until the last of the Jews are exterminated from the continent. Wow. Okay. Lucky for the Jews, he decided to spread that in the Middle East. By the way, here is Gaza. See this little red piece right here? That's what's affecting possibly the whole world. Gaza, right there. Okay, here's Egypt. Here's Saudi Arabia, Syria, Iraq. Turkey is up here. Cyprus is here. Here's Persia. But it's not called Persia anymore. No, no, not called Persia. Persia and Germany were allies at the time. Eventually, Persia changed their name to Iran. Why? The suggestion for the name change made by Iranian diplomats to Germany to the uh, Persian foreign ministry in Tehran. Iran was considered to be the birthplace, the original homeland of the Aryan race. The significance of this in Farsi, the language they speak in Iran, this means the land of the Aryans. Oh, man, we all know how those Aryans, darn it, back in World War II, think of the Jews. 
Oh, they love them. World War II, over. Jews survive. They start coming down to their homeland because they're hated everywhere. Harry Truman is now in office, 1945. Harry Truman was, man, he was quite different than FDR. He was a religious guy, a biblically Christian man. He wasn't a bigot. He had, um, one of his best friends was uh, Jewish, a man named Eddie Jacobson. They had been friends since 1905, but they had fallen out of touch with each other. Um, but they liked each other. A decade went by, World War I comes together, brings the two friends back together. And they operated a regimental canteen together. And they liked each other. I mean, I've read the letters between Truman and Bess, and he's like, oh, my, my, my old Jew friend is here. I mean, it's just bizarre. But they made a pact while they were serving together in World War II. They admired each other so much. They said, you know what? We should go into business. If we survive, let's go into business. They never wrote any of their agreements down. They just shook hands on it. It was good enough. After the war, they kept their word. They opened Truman and Jacobson Gents Furnishings in 1919. In 1922, it went out of business. But these two guys didn't file bankruptcy. They decided to pay back all of their own debts. It took them from 1922 to 1937 to do it. They recalled that it, it took a lot of sacrifice, but both of us are glad that the old firm of Truman and Jacobson doesn't own anyone, owe anyone a dime. That's the kind of men they were. Honorable. Okay. FDR dies. He's in office. President Truman had sympathy for the Jewish people, supported the Balfour Declaration because you signed it. What are you doing? Stop it. He also felt, you know, they were being chased and killed. They deserve a place to live. And he was a Bible-fearing man. He also believed that they were just kind of an extension of us, for no other reason than maybe just the Bible told us so. Truman was under tremendous pressure from all sides not to intervene on the behalf of the Jews by the Soviets. The State Department sabotaged this guy. There's a great uh, book that I read. I don't know. Uh, Joe, what's the name of that book? Um, uh, Truman and the Founding of Israel or something. I think it's by Mike Benson. I read it a couple of years ago. It's, it's, it's fantastic. The State Department sabotaged Harry Truman, did everything they could. Why? Because they feared the Arab nations would restrict oil supplies to America. So back then, it was all about oil. Hmm. Well, the UN decided they were going to pass a resolution to create the State of Israel. The Arab League Council directed governments to send troops to the border. Nevertheless, Truman believed this was the right thing to do. His friend set him up with Mr. Wiseman, I think, he, I think he was actually responsible for actually getting him in to the White House at the last minute. And he ordered the State Department to support the UN resolution. November 29, 1947, the partition plan was passed in the UN General Assembly. UN Resolution 181 defined the outline of the settlement. 1947. UN, UN partition divided the area into three entities. There was the Jewish state, the Arab state, and the international zone all around Jerusalem. Throughout all of this, Truman looked to Eddie Jacobson, seek his advice. He's pictured here with Wiseman. Do we have it? There he is. This is Wiseman, the guy who helped Great Britain out. It was Jacobson who helped arrange the secret meeting of the White House between these two. March 1948, where it said that Truman pledged his commitment to the Jewish state. Didn't take long for things to get dicey. Not long after, midnight, May 14, 1948, Provisional Government of Israel proclaimed the new state of Israel. That same day, President Truman recognized the Jewish government as de facto authority over the new Jewish state. Truman believed he was doing the work of God. Truman, with the help of Eddie Jacobson, is the reason why we have the state of Israel born for that mission, he felt. That's how we got Israel. And the next day,